Nikon P1000 for group field trips, a spotting scope alternative. This is another JDW Talks. If you want to know more about me, you can go to that website. This was recorded in July of 2020. I dedicate this to those who lead field trips and introduce birding and the world of nature to the public. Let's start with some definitions. A spotting telescope, or a scope as I'll call it, is usually used for terrestrial viewing. The image appears the same way that we see the scene, our eye views the scene, which is different than an astronomy scope. There are many uses for scopes, but for the purposes of this uh, video, uh, I'm going to assume it's for birding and nature observation. It's generally used in habitats where line of sight is unimpeded, like coastal areas, or large lakes, that sort of thing. And I've used scopes for leading field trips to, for the public, uh, college biology students, naturalist training for docents, and docent to be. Now, my ideal group field trip scope would be something that would be easy to handle, to, to carry, to set up, and uh, a good lightweight tripod would also be involved in the scope uh, setup. I want to provide views so all members of my field trip group can see magnified images of the bird. The bird should be seen doing things in real time, I want to show behaviors. The image quality should be high, should be easy to see, and hopefully there might be some sort of documentation uh, possible, uh, like uh, being able to photograph or, or have audio or video. My actual experiences have been trying to get to that ideal. And uh, I've tried a number of different uh, ways. For instance, on one uh, beginning field trip, I brought a whole bunch of scopes with me on tripods. Mirror scopes, um, uh, refractors, angled scopes, it's straightforward, all with tripods. And most were not used. And I think one of the, one of the problems was that th these were beginners. They were given loaner binoculars, and some of them were very good, actually, and hadn't had much experience with the binoculars themselves and we're still fooling around with that, trying to figure them out. And here I'm asking them to look through a more expensive, uh, more uh, um, uh, technology. Uh, it might be an anxious situation. Maybe that's one of the reasons why they decided not to go to those, those scopes. The simpler the scope, the easier it was to use, the greater the chance that my participants would use it. Then I tried attaching cameras with small screens to a scope, that's called digiscoping, with various apparatus, which made basically the scope useless for other applications. And when you do digiscoping like this, the field of view is very narrow. Uh, it's probably pretty good only for birds that don't move very much. Um, that didn't work out. And I thought about maybe using a, a tablet uh, uh, and uh, uh, putting that on a scope. It can be done. There are adapters available, but that would be an awkward syst system as well, and it wouldn't solve, solve the problems. And finally today, I'm working with super zoom cameras and a field monitor. I started this, uh, did uh, one field trip last fall uh, that, that had promise, and then this pandemic hit and that's the reason why I wanted to make this video uh, to get people thinking about using new technology as an alternate to the traditional spotting scope uh, led field trip. So let me tell you two stories. They're going to have different endings. Same story. I'm leading a field trip. I have my spotting scope with me. I find a really neat bird in my spotting scope, probably at high magnification. Um, I say, look at that bird over there. 
the participants are trying to find it with their binoculars. Uh, some of them can't even find their shoes with their binoculars. Uh, some of them are saying, oh, yeah, I see that bird. Yeah, they're looking at a different bird. I don't know that. So I try and push people to look through my scope. And they line up finally. And the first one, oh, you know, maybe. The second one comes up and says, I can't see anything in the scope at all. And there's a reason for that. Uh, they're not looking at the sweet spot. They're not looking at the the exit pupil of the, of the scope. The third person comes up and looks in the scope and tells me I don't see the bird in view. It must have moved. Well, that's one possibility. Another one is that the second person might have kicked the scope or was wearing a um, um, a baseball type hat with a brim. And this is an angled scope and knocked the scope off the bird. And I'm trying to resolve all this sort of thing. In the meantime, the bird flies away. I'm frustrated. My group is frustrated. So I say, so sorry, folks. Maybe we will see it later. If it's a rare bird, we won't see it later. Same situation. I find a neat bird using my super zoom camera. And on the top of it is a field monitor. I can zoom quickly to wide angle. And people have an idea of what I'm looking at. I can zoom in and they have a greater chance of finding it with their binoculars. I easily take a picture of the bird with just, you know, a click. Everyone, everyone can see the bird at the same time in real time on the field monitor. The bird flies away. However, I quickly switch to the photograph, magnify it in the camera. They see it in the monitor and can point out the field marks. Everybody is happy. I'm happy. Perhaps in the field, uh, they get a copy of the picture on their smartphones within minutes. And actually, that's not science fiction. Uh, on one field trip with a, a super zoom, not the one I have now, uh, I transferred the picture from the camera into my iPhone and my iPhone into people uh, who had iPhones around me. And that was an interesting experience. Now, the problem with all of these is to buy into it and not revert back to the old system. And uh, um, it's going to take a while for me to, uh, to experiment with this technique and to change my habits. So my equipment here, and this is not a review of equipment. There are lots of different super zoom cameras on the market today. But I have a Nikon P1000 super zoom camera. I have a seven inch ultra bright field monitor that is rated so that in, in uh, sunlight, you can still see the image very well. And all sorts of batteries and cables and other things as well. I have the necessary batteries. I have some ways of taking pictures, either with a, a wired uh, approach or with a remote uh, uh, clicker. However, that remote over there doesn't appear to work when the field monitor is plugged into the camera. Now, let me tell you first why you shouldn't use this setup. The camera is very heavy. It's awkward. It's awkward to carry with a tripod. Have to be careful. Uh, it's unbalanced in the sense that that the lens comes forward and shifts the uh, the center of gravity. It's delicate. It's not weatherproof. Scopes are weatherproof. They are designed to withstand a certain amount of rigor, bumping, that sort of thing. And I had to modify the camera to avoid the camera rotating uh, and unscrewing from the mount on top of the tripod takes more knowledge and support equipment to run this. Uh, lots of equipment. It's relatively expensive for a modified point and shoot camera. And in fact, the sensor plate, uh, the size of it in this camera is the same size as in your smartphone. And finally, there's this Zen objection. Are we experiencing nature? Are we actually seeing the bird? or a picture we could transmit to a person not even near the action? Are they experiencing the same nature as we are? 
I'm showing you here uh, a website that is a very clever way of reducing or even eliminating that lateral movement of the camera on the mount. And it does not modify the camera at all. A very, very clever way of doing it. And you might want to take a look at that. Now, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to promote this camera. I'm going to say, hey, this is pretty good, in spite of all the other things I've just told you. The a typical uh, spotting scope uh, has a zoom lens from 20 to 60 power. Those are real power. Uh, what I see is one power. Uh, the P1000 goes up to an equivalent magnification of 60 power. The way uh, the camera manufacturers tell you the magnification is not what a birder uh, thinks about. You see the P1000 goes from 60 power, equivalent magnification, to a half a power. And what the Nikon does is they say, well, 60 over one half is 120 magnification. And they will tell you that the P1000 has 120 magnification. Well, in their definition, it's true. But in the definition of eyesight is one power, it only goes up to 60. I hope you see that, that difference. It drives me crazy. And if you're going down to the lower magnification, you need to remove that lens hood. I have a lens hood that I put on the camera to, uh, to protect it. I also have a UV filter in the front to protect the lens. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some slides, um, some, uh, some pictures of the P1000 in action. It's on bird mode, and um, I'm taking pictures of the camera with my iPhone. I'm seeing a lot of reflection off of the glass surfaces. And I'm taking pictures of birds on a small jetty in uh, Dana Point Harbor, about 550 feet from the camera. I measure that on Google Maps. The last picture is going to be equivalent of about 60 power. Now, you will see on the, um, the, the, the pictures, OK800, okay that's not the lens equivalent. Uh, that is part of the setup for the bird mode. So here we are looking at the back of the camera with my iPhone. There's lots of stuff on the, um, the field monitor. This is a seven inch field monitor. I can remove most of that by cycling through a display button and you'll see I can remove most of it. I'm looking at this jetty, which is 550 feet away. And there is a zoom lever in the front. I start to work that. I'm now a little bit closer to the jetty. Now I'm a little bit closer, and this is all optical zooming. This is not digital. It's not like I'm taking a picture and I'm expanding it on a, on a screen. It's all optical. Let's get a little closer. I think those three birds on the right, uh, I then sent to the camera on. You notice that a lot of the writing on the, uh, uh, on the monitor is gone. Uh, it's, it was actually on the uh, camera telling me all the settings and another one. So here is that 60 power and we have three brown pelicans. You see a lot of reflections off of the, um, uh, the monitor. And by the way, the monitor, I put at about 70% of uh, light. It can go up to 100%. It could be very brighter than that. Now, I can take a picture of a bird before it flies and magnify the picture in the camera and therefore on the monitor. And then I can actually use digital magnification uh, on the image in the camera. That way I'll be able to see really good details on this bird and field marks, a great teaching tool. And the next slide sequence illustrates this, most taken with the iPhone 5S. So this picture here is a download from the Nikon P1000. It's been not been cropped. It has not been modified or retouched in any way. 
Didn't touch the contrast. I didn't touch anything. This is what you get. Now, I'll show you that what I can do with this picture in the camera is I can get to that picture uh, folder. If I move the lever, the zoom lever, it jumps to three power digital magnification. So now what it's done is it's only look, and I can move it around the original photo, moved it to the left where that uh, single brown pelican was uh, not preening itself. Okay, and that's the Catalina Express, by the way, coming out of the Dana Point Harbor. Those dots out on the water are paddle boaters. And here's another view of it showing uh, uh, a little better color on this. Now, I took a lot of these uh, pictures like this in the trunk of my vehicle on June 30th and decided on June 30th that I would make this video. Uh, I was going to just use a couple of these photos in another video I was working on, which were instructions to how to use spotting scopes uh, for general public field trips. Now, it turns out that the camera actually goes up to a 10 power um, a zoom in. And so uh, at night, uh, I actually took a picture uh, since the, the uh, photos were still in the camera uh, of the monitor on the camera. This is not the field monitor. And went up to 10x. And so you're seeing the tip of the bird of that to the left at 550 feet. Incredible magnification. All right, now, another thing that is of concern here is everyone should be able to see the same bird on the monitor live at the same time if it has a wide enough field of view. And this particular field monitor doesn't need a hood, which would restrict people looking to shade it from sunlight. Participants should be able to see the bird in their binoculars and on the screen at the same time. So they're getting a live experience. And I wanna show you that in the next slide sequences, I'm gonna move away from the camera. I did brighten the iPhone's pictures. So let's start with this picture again. I'm gonna start moving away from the tripod. I can still see that picture. Now, I've not retouched this. All I've done is brighten the scene uh, because the, uh, the, the I'm looking toward where the sun should be. It's an overcast day. I'm a little bit farther away. You can see the paddle boat is out there. So you can go quite quite a bit farther away and still see pretty good images. And actually you could use your binoculars probably if they have a good near focus on this screen. Now, I'm gonna show, show you another capability of this camera. Um, where that arrow is out there is where there's an Osprey sitting on that tower. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take a video of that. But before I do that, I wanna tell you some more advantages that the participants don't touch the optical setup. They don't come close to the tripod. They don't kick it, kick off the, uh, the leg. The unit is about half the price of a high level spotting scope setup and tripod, and you end up with a multiple use camera. It reduces the number of scopes needed for the field trip. So you don't have to keep setting up scopes if you're all looking at the same bird. And as I point out, there are a number of super zoom camera models and brands available now uh, with a lot of choices. But I think the Nikon P1000 probably has the greatest magnification. Okay, so let's get back to the Osprey. So here's an Osprey on the tower on that outer jetty on June 30th that I uh, initially found with binoculars. Uh, it's, according to Google Maps, it's 1300 feet away from me and I'm gonna show you a video. And we're gonna go from 60 to one half X. 
I didn't remove the hood, so it's going to vignette. So here is the start of it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to press the video button and there's a certain amount of uh, vibration in the system. Uh, there is anti-vibration technology in the camera and I can take a handheld picture of a bird at 60 power if I, if I hold it a little bit steady and do a very fast speed. But you'll see a little bit of shaking. Uh, the Osprey is going to turn its head and then we're going to come right back to the uh, where the tripod is. Pretty impressive. There's another video that you may be interested in that I've been working along with this one, the present one, and that's teaching a beginning birding group how to use a spotting scope and in that video i discuss spotting scopes and uh, how they're used in the field etiquette uh, of using a spotting scope and some aspects of it that should improve uh, the field experience it's designed for burning groups beginning burning groups uh, and training docents etc so you might want to take a look at that as well. My next project is going to be take, take a, uh, uh, a workshop that I published in 2018 for finding out how binoculars work and what to look for. And uh, I've given you a link to that. If you're a teacher and want to set up a binocular workshop lab, I suggest strongly you get a copy. Uh, you can get it for free and I'm going to try and make a video of that uh, in the future. So I hope you enjoyed our little look at a possible alternative. Might as well use some of the new technology that's available. When this pandemic is over, there's probably going to be a discussion about whether we can go back to the, using our equipment on field trips, uh, on group field trips with public. Uh, the same way we did before. So you have listened and looked at one of my JDW talks on YouTube. I have two virtual birding field trips, one in Coastal Sage and one along the coast of Dana Point, California. I have two talks on the life of the naturalist Adolphus L. Hearman, in which there have been a number of uh, species named for him both bot botanical species and animal species. And these two optic torques so far, uh, my uh, major claim to fame actually is in, uh, right now is in genealogy and the census work. And I have six census torques online, uh, including uh, what's gonna happen when the 1950 census becomes public in April of 2022. And by the end of August, I'm going to have five talks on Ellis Island, including how to find difficult people on ship manifests and what's called the name change myth. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you're interested in when that binocular workshop comes out, um, subscribe. Uh, you can spread the word on this. Thanks for watching.